good. Chris is on, so I will, I'll use the mic um, as we go here. So, again, thank you uh, all for, what's wrong with you? You're still here. That's great. I'm glad they made the last session a little bit earlier this year than usual because, uh, you know, I know it's, it's taxing after a couple of days. So, again, I, I want to uh, just make the point that uh, this is an amazing conference. So the, the volunteers, the uh, executive committee uh, that puts this on, um, definitely thank them as, as, you, as you leave. And uh, hopefully you've got a couple of new connections uh, as you leave here and are motivated to do really fun stuff. And probably the thing I get most out of conferences is I get really motivated to want to do more stuff. So my name is Doc, uh, I'll just, I'm just Charlie Apigian. I'm from uh, Middle Tennessee State University and... I'm Chris Miller. I'm a Crown Data Analyst, as you oh, can see here. Off. You need my, yeah. th my print there, so I'll please come back up. I'm a Crime Data Analyst with Murfreesboro Police Department. And so we decided uh, a, a while ago, and one thing that I, I continually hear the theme is people looking to partner with education or figure out ways that they can do things with educational uh, partners. And that doesn't just mean for your schools, it just means you know, how you want your future workforce, how can you get access to them. And so one of the things that I'm really passionate about is trying to figure that out. And um, going back to last summer, um, I can actually say that this project all started the way all projects start, over a couple of beers. And that's the best way you know it happens. But one of the detectives in, in Murfreesboro uh, Police Department, James Abbott, and I were just talking, and he said, you know, what can we do to figure out what it takes to play with data? And we know we have data, we struggle with it, but can we actually use our data to help with real problems? And so I said, that's great, let's go, can I come over to the police department and let's see what we can do? And what James did um, was introduce me to Chris. And so. Yeah, so um, I've been kind of a stats guy for like seven years now, which at my age, I'm 26, has been forever. And um, so I, I've always been about the numbers of police work. And uh, ever since I read this one paper that we'll mention briefly a little bit later, um, I've just been dying to do a predictive model. And so just one day, Charlie comes sauntering into my office and uh, the rest is history because I just jumped on in as soon as I possibly could. So today is really about the journey that we went through to get to what is our current model, which doesn't mean it's the last one, um, but we're at that point where we can sort of put it into production. And, and I know John asked the question last time, he had everybody raise their hand, how many of you actually deployed a model before? And you know, not as many hands go up as how many people have developed a model. And so that was where I was. It's like being an academic, I'm like, I can develop models all day long with fake data, but wouldn't it be cool if I could see one start to finish? And that's what uh, Chris was willing to let me do. Um, so that's what our journey is about today. It's about figuring out a lot of different things about creating a model where there's a lot of barriers. Bad data, we, we've heard that before. And a lot of things that happen in the police department where the number one thing is your safety, go out and collect data. And so we have to take that in consideration when we're trying to figure out what we can do. So I'm gonna give a quick plug for what we do at MTSU, real quick. Um, and again, um, data science is obviously a new area. We've now been doing it for a little bit. Um, within information systems and analytics, we have been teaching at the undergrad level as well as a, a business intelligence and analytics master's degree. About a year and a half ago, we started Data Science Institute, and um, we are always looking at opportunities to develop students, facilitate faculty in some big research projects. I'm pretty happy to say I was able to get a, a couple of grants this summer to help um, really from the research side um, and explore data for the community. I'm, I'm a big fan of going after nonprofit work um, to help our, our local community. And my big mission right now is to figure out how to figure out public and private partnerships. How can we work with industry in academics to really uh, foster incredible opportunities to create that future workforce? Um, we, got a couple, we, we will, within the next year, have a bachelor's, master's level uh, education as well as we do have a PhD in computational science, 
which is now uh, also uh, data science as well, because they've always been data science. It's just we're actually going to call it that now as well. So we're going all the different areas of that. Okay, commercial over. Um, I don't care if anybody comes back to MTSU. How many MTSU grads we have in the room? Oh, it's beautiful. Thank you so much. A lot of you are familiar faces. Some are not. Uh, so uh, I know we, we, we do a pretty good job of creating that local workforce, and, and we love doing that. Okay, so let's get into why and where we um, started this. And so, Chris, t tell us some of the background on this project and why, why was it burglaries uh, that we uh, decided to kind of use as our main project here? Yeah, well, first of all, burglaries are, are a, a serious crime. Um, you don't want to be shelling in all these hours to be creating a model to predict vandalism as much as you do for burglaries or something like that. But in addition to that, you'll know that um, burglaries are also pretty predictive, like predictable. Uh, there's a lot of literature out there that talks about how burglaries beget burglaries and one burglary will follow another. They're called uh, near repeat patterns in the literature. Um, and there's also a lot of burglaries in Murfreesboro um, relative to something like homicide. Uh, you only get you know, a handful, thank goodness, of homicides in this region every year. And it's not very easy to create a burglary uh, or, excuse me, a homicide prediction model when you only have 12 data points a year. So it's kind of in that sweet spot between being serious and also um, having a lot of data to work with and also uh, there being an empirical basis for them following patterns. Yeah, now, now let's think about that. And again, I want, you to, I, want you to, I want you to feel like you're going through this with us. So when we start the idea of what do we want to go after, well, the number one most serious thing is obviously murders. Um, well, when there's so few data points, how are we going to predict that? And then think of the different crimes out there that are really random. Um, car theft is, is, is one that's kind of hard to go after, or, or all the different types of ones. But there's one type of crime that usually is case. You know, they'll go and case an area before they go. And you'll see a lot of neighborhoods where there'll be three or four burglaries within a week because they understand they've, they've been there for a few weeks. They'll go and they'll, they'll do things a week or two ahead of time. And so we were, that's where uh, Chris came to me and said, I think burglaries are, are something that we could probably try to predict. And I was like, okay, well, what kind of data do we have? And so that's when we really started focusing on burglaries as that idea. But we went through what we thought was the right process to try to identify that. So if anybody's ever seen like the CRISP model, um, you know, starting with the, the, the business problem, figuring out what data that you have for that, then going into the data prep, model building, and then hopefully deployment. And in most cases, you have to iterate a couple of times, right? You do your first model, and you are able to pre predict at 2%. Well, that's obviously not good enough, or, or whatever it is. And so trying to figure out what the right data is. So, so if you're sitting here right now, what, what are you starting to think? What would be some of the data points that you think could help predict burglaries? What do you think? Let's make this interactive. This is, this is a choose your own adventure kind of thing, right? So, how many people travel? How often they travel outside of their house? Do you have data on that? Okay, so you want us to uh, get social media posts. I like it. Uh, what's up? Time of day. Um, how do we know when so sometimes burglaries we think we know and happen, but we don't know until the person comes home? And so a lot of times there's a lag there, and actually it's one of the big problems that Chris has is trying to figure out when things happen. For example, do you realize that most car theft is reported at 5 a.m.? It's because that's when, or 6 a.m., or whenever they go out to their car that morning, it's not when it actually occurs. So these are some of the questions that we were able to kind of think about. Street lights. Street lights. Oh, you're getting into more of the infrastructure. I like that. Yes, um, so burglaries from the past, right? You can look at that kind of data. What, what else we got? Trespassing. Trespassing. So you're going into other crimes that have happened in the past to help predict future. I like that one. Go ahead. Whether or not the neighbors have one way in, one way out. Yeah, and again, do you have that data? Maybe. Uh, <laughs> now, there's always, uh, we, we, we went after the data we currently had originally. Um, go ahead. 
Yeah, that's one that we've got to add. We got there's a there's a couple that we have to add. Go ahead, Kevin. Okay. Um, we'll get into that one. Go ahead. Distance from the highway. That'd be a good one, or even just main um, areas. And, you know, um, uh, as we looked at this, we originally went with a couple of different uh, data sets. Let's see if I can uh, get to that. So, um, well, before we get into that, first of all, we were taking this as a academic exercise. So, um, Chris has a, a good background, but he wanted to learn more. And so one of the things that I want to make sure of is whatever I did, I wanted it to be a teaching opportunity. I've always got to be the teacher, right? And so a lot of the code that I wrote or we wrote together uh, was really to make sure that we both could understand it or if they brought in a new data analyst, they could understand that. And why don't you give them a little bit of what does um, the Orangeville Police Department kind of look like um, just in terms of police officers, how many data analysts are there, things like that? So we have two data analysts and about 240 patrol officers and like a collection of maybe like 50 detectives. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to do is a lot of them just want to go from call to call, but there's also going to be a lot of downtime between calls. And oftentimes um, they'll spend this time on what's called a special watch. And um, they'll sit at the same location for quite literally two weeks. Um, at, at a spot that they kind of have a feeling in their gut is a hot spot for crime for that particular next set of two weeks. So we have 240 officers, but we also have 240 officers who at any given time might have a need to be somewhere uh, where there's a crime hot spot about to happen and not somewhere where a, a crime spot, you know, might maybe in their gut happen. Yeah, and, and so one of the uh, other things that uh, Chris had kind of said is, Usually on, it's Tuesdays, right? Tuesdays a day that he'll report to uh, the police officers and, and, and the chief of police on what's happened the previous week or, or whatever else they, they have happened to be uh, reporting on. So it's not like at this point we need something where there's an alert going off at 12 o'clock at night. It was more about can we create a weekly report to be able to help out? So our objective then became, can we come up with where those hot spots would be within the city of Murfreesboro <coughs> for the next week? And can we then try to predict, predict that? And so then what data do we have that can help us either on a weekly basis or um, yearly and, and things like that? And that's where we got into what types of data sets. And, and one other thing I wanted to mention about that is You've got to have buy-in from the command staff because, yep. as everyone probably knows, uh, police work is a quasi-military kind of structure. There's going to be a command staff that tells the people what to do below them, and there's that chain of command. So if I, I figured that if I can inform the command staff about where burglaries are going to be the next week in these weekly Tuesday meetings, then that will eventually trickle down uh, to where the patrol officers will actually be at the right spot at the right time. Yeah, and actually, before I even met with Chris, uh, Detective uh, Abbott had me meet with the chief of police, um, uh, uh, Chief Bowen, just to get buy-in first. And, and again, this was a, an individual with 40 years experience. I was not going to tell him anything. He already had it in his gut, a lot of this stuff. A lot of what we were trying to do is be able to bring the data. Burglar alarms are a big deal and an indicator for the, uh, future burglaries. He knows that, but he doesn't have that data at his fingertips like he can now. Um, and so you have to understand, you know, am I looking to confirm what he already knows or am I trying to bring new insight? And both things are kind of a good thing, right? It's, uh, his gut, if, if all of a sudden there's data to back that up, that's kind of a good thing for our police department. So um, here's uh, just some ideas where we started with data. So I think, Kevin, you, you'd mentioned, you know, kind of like median household, but a lot of census type data. So we went and grabbed all the census data for uh, Murfreesboro and it's, you can get it categorized by census blocks. Is that, is that, that's the correct term mm, for census it, Census right? blocks. Uh, we, we, we termed it as GOIDs. And I think there's 79 GOIDs. 76. 76. Chris is awesome. <laughs> this is great. It's like, Told it's you, like the, the numbers perfect guy. little partnership we have going here. I love it. Um, so there's 76 different GOIDs within Murfreesboro. And you can get all the different demographics. There's 3,200 different uh, features that are in that uh, data set. Uh, for those 76 uh, GOIDs. And a lot of it is like median um, 
uh, it could be a medium, median age, and then it has like 18 different categories and counts of, every, of the number within each one of the different categories. So we had to do a lot of cleaning um, to, to do that. Actually, data computing on this, uh, one of, one of our, our, our students. So we had that data set. Now, how often does census data change? <laughs> 10 years. Uh, and I think this was data that's once a year. Well, there's also this thing called the American Community Survey. And obviously, the census is a census, and they that's try to get everyone. Years. But the American Community Survey is done once a year as more of a statistical thing, where they get more of a sample. Um, and so in a way, you could say that census data is annual because they're doing that ACS survey once a year. And, and one thing that is worth noting, though, is um, yeah, a lot of these things that were mentioned are good predictors for crime. So unemployment is a great predictor of crime. But again, that only comes out once a year. And we were talking about having this, these predictions come out once a week. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that's helpful. Um, and not, but, but is it really the meaningful part of what we want? And think about burglaries for a second. We're wanting to go where there's going to be a burglary, not find where the person lives, right? We're, we're wanting to go stop a burglary. Where are burglaries in your city? Okay, neighborhoods, and I think your neighborhoods are everywhere, every different demographic, every type of house, every type of community out there. So it's not just, you can't just say, let's patrol the low income areas. That make, doesn't make sense, actually, because there's more home burglaries in areas where they're more affluent. Um, so that means pretty much all of Murfreesboro kind of falls into that. And so does the census data make much sense, <coughs> much sense then? And that's that was some of the questions that we had. Um, so um, going through that, again, we took basically three different um, data sets. And I think I've actually got that a little bit wrong on there. So we had census data. Um, and we, yeah, there's 7,000. I, I said only 3,200. 7,732 different categories within that. But again, a lot of redundancy. We brought that down to a pretty manageable number, like like under 30, I think is what we ended up having in the end. Um, leading indicators, talk about what, what you consider leading indicators. Yeah, so that comes from the paper that we cited a little bit earlier, where one of the things they did is they took like small crimes and disorder offenses, things like um, noise complaints or maybe a dog barking, and those, comes, those come in as calls to 911, even if you know, they shouldn't be. Um, and what this paper that we mentioned earlier did is try to see whether or not these small offenses can actually be, be used to predict more serious crime. So um, for the most part, these leading indicators were just calls for service, just calls to dispatch, um, which have varying degrees of seriousness, but might half the time just be something like a noise complaint. But um, each, now, correct me if I'm wrong on this, each call will have a disposition as well, mm -hmm. right? So what's a disposition? So a disposition is what the dispatcher says about the call after they've hung up the phone. So half the time, one of these things um, is going to be coded as um, no contact. So a police officer came out to see the noise, noise complaint. They didn't hear anything. They talked to some people. They said they didn't hear anything. They didn't see anyone making any loud noises. And that's a no contact. Another example of a one might be a report whatever call was made actually made its way into a police report. And that would be RF or report filed, or an NR if there's no report. So um, just whatever categorization the dispatcher will give is the disposition associated with that call or the leading indicator. So for every call, there should be some type of disposition. So you really have two different, um, different decisions um, that have been made for uh, each one. So you could say, yeah, burglar alarm, um, and it was a false alarm or burglar alarm report filed. Um, so all, the, all these different uh, things. Arrest made uh, is one. And so, um, and, and looking at that, and so our original data set, we had one year of data for one of those. Which one, was it burglaries or leading indicators? Uh, I think it was burglaries. Burglaries. So we also took the burglaries, because we'll, we, we uh, Chris had mentioned, based on, on the research that he had done, that burglaries, of course, will lead to future burglaries in that area. Have you ever heard of a neighborhood that had like eight burglaries within like a two week period? Um, that's not out of, the, out of the norm. That does happen. We had it in Murfreesboro, I think that was January, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, and, and part of that goes into the psychology of burglary is that if someone's gonna commit crime, they typically wanna do it in a, in a space they're comfortable with. 
So if I'm burglarizing one house in one neighborhood, I might go down the street the next night because I already know the layout of the houses, more or less. I know all the egress and uh, uh, I know all the routes in and out. And um, I have a familiarity with the area that allows me to do this thing, which is actually pretty scary for me, too. I'm, I'm always afraid if I'm a burglar of being caught and I want to lower the risk as much as I can. So again, like we said, burglaries beget burglaries. Yeah, and I think this, if there's anything that we can ever say is when you see suspicious activity, call your police department. Get that on record because if you see a, a car going around next week, you never know what's going to happen in your neighborhood. I'm not trying to scare anybody today, but, uh, <laughs> but that's the kind of stuff that we were really trying to uh, get at with this uh, analysis. So in the end, you can see I've got call activity and dispositions. These are just uh, sorting it to see kind of what um, uh, are the most, and burglar alarms are the biggest uh, set of calls within Murfreesboro with that data set. And then the different uh, dispositions, RF is report filed. Um, and R, no report. R -R -E -S means resolve. So the dispatcher just said they resolved it on their own. Clear, same thing, basically. And so you can see there are like, 93 actually different dispositions that a call can end up being coded as in our system over so many years. And some of those are redundant, so we had to do some data translation uh, tables to make sure that false alarms were coded all the same and, and things like that in the end. Um, so we um, decided to do everything in Python because that's what I'm comfortable with and um, it was something that uh, Chris wanted to learn and so we went through this all together. We actually, and I, and I I'm failing to mention one other individual. Um, it's uh, Dr. Steve Morris, who's a uh, colleague of mine. He said, uh, again, I think it was over beers. Uh, sorry, I'm not an alcoholic, I swear. <laughs> uh, but he, uh, he had heard I was interested in doing this project, and he's like, I love this stuff. Can I, can I be part of it? And I'm like, well, well sure. What do you want to get up? He goes, nothing. I just think it would be really cool to do. And so he came uh, and was part of the team as well. We did a little bit of SQL, and, and if anybody knows anything about Dr. Morris, he's an SQL genius, guru. Um, he's fantastic uh, at that side. So I'm like, oh, I'll give you this little bit to do, even though I could have done it in Python in like two minutes. But you know, hey, I wanted to make him feel like he was part of the team. And, but more importantly was the really the, the three to four hour strategy sessions we had, yeah. where we sat down and said, OK, what should go in this thing? How should we uh, uh, code this? What should we do with it? Wait a minute, and, and Steve was always great. He'd be like, I don't, I don't follow what you guys are doing here. And we'd bring it back, it's like, oh, you're right, I'm wrong. I went off too far into one direction. And so, um, uh, anyways, we, we decided to do uh, most of the work within um, uh, Python, um, going all the way from importing the data to uh, cleansing, transforming, and then different. Uh, um, so if you can think about how we really were trying to do this, so I, I put it as Berg status. Um, so the idea here is, do we care how many burglaries are in a specific area? Or do we just care if there's going to be a burglary within a week? Remember, we're looking at weeks, right? What do we care about? Trying to predict how many or if there's going to be one? if there's going to be one, right? So that's because we're patrolling. We want to get officers to the right place at the right time. So for us to say there's going to be two or there's going to be three, Chief Bowen's going to say, I don't really care. If it's one, that's all I care about. So we did it based on what we call Berg, Berg status, which just means if it was one or more, it became a one. If it was zero, it was a zero. So obviously that makes it classification. And so that was the models that we chose to do. Uh, the different data sets that we put in there, uh, we had the census data that we brought down from 7,732 different categories down to something like 30. Um, we uh, used those leading indicators, the calls and the dispositions, and then we added something else at the end, uh, which uh, is elo eloquently called slag, <laughs> and tell us what that is. So um, slag is short for spatial lag. So that just means that there's going to be, um, if there's a burglary close to the target area. So if I'm examining um, a burglary in downtown Nashville, the spatial lag on that might be down the street at the McDonald's by I-24. So adjacent areas that kind of complement the area in question. Yeah, and so I, I will say this, the work that Chris had to do to get to that point was, it was, was, was a lot of work. 
and not just that, but he had to be real creative in trying to figure that out. Um, one of the um, main uh, tools that he was using just you know, to really come up with a space part uh, is ArcGIS and um, using a lot of the Esri products. Um, so taking that to be able to uh, figure out the map and if anybody's ever played around with that, you know, Esri st type stuff, it's, it's pretty powerful stuff. Now even has an import for Python, by the way. Um, and that's what we've been playing around with lately. Um, but to get to that point was a lot of work. And he has to then go try to get more data. It, it, it was, it was a, a pretty extensive work. So at the end of the day, what we're really trying to do is take, let's say, this week's data to predict next week, right? And by the way, this was like the hardest part of this whole thing, as, as silly as it sounds, is how are we going to t figure out next week? So we have to take next week's burglaries and use that as our target variable, right? So our target variable is the burg status for next week and take this week's data to help predict next week. Okay, so that's what the model really was. Um, and we included burglaries in that as well because obviously we we know that that's also a predictor. So when it's burglaries predicting burglaries, it's actually <coughs> last week's burglaries or this week's burglaries predicting next week's burglaries as, as, as a variable. And, and one of the things I wanted to mention about the logic behind burg status is uh, one of the dirty secrets of law enforcement is if, if there's going to be an arrest made by someone, it's usually when it's done in the act. And so an officer can either be there or not be there so in a way, um, our response to the model of being there or not being there reflects what the model actually produces, which is a Berg status of one or zero. Excellent. Okay. Let's uh, quickly get through this one so we can, because uh, there's going to be more iterations than one. So again, we had to take all the data, and you think about if we had uh, 10,000 records, we didn't really care about the 10,000 records. We cared about each week. So if anybody uh, ever plays around um, in Python, you can pivot, you can melt. And you have to do a lot of different plans to get it to where every time we run this now, it takes about 30 to 40 seconds. Um, but as long as I have new data, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't, you know, we want it to be reproducible so that hopefully for Chris and his uh, team, all they have to do is press a button and it takes next week's and, and adds it to the model for prediction type stuff. So um, as we played around with it, what we, here's all of our features that we uh, came up with looking at the top is really all we kept from census data. And then we have, uh, right here in blue is all of your leading indicators. And then what's in green is the same leading indicators, but from all the complementary areas. So that's the slag, you know, the spatial lag uh, around that. So if you look at assault here, that's for that specific GOID, but assault uh, on the other side would be the assault for all of the adjacent areas around it. Um, so that's what we used as our features. Um, building that first model, um, we came up with, and I'm looking at this one's actually one of our logistic models, and I think this is a perfect example of do not be satisfied because accuracy is good, okay? Um, if you look on here, um, let's see, it might be my next slide. If I have to go back, I will. Yeah, I'd rather look at, make it so it's nice and close up. So if you think about it, we were pretty accurate, 85% accuracy. We're done, right? We're absolutely great. Let's pack it in. We're done. <laughs> we did it. We are 100. It looks fantastic. And I'm like, wait a minute. All we did was say there's no burglaries. Can you see that? So it's hard to sometimes read. The confusion matrix is actually called confusion matrix to confuse you, just in case you ever have that issue. Um, but you've got basically your, um, your total uh, weeks where there were not burglaries is the big number really there. And then you're seeing the ones that are actual burglaries. So that's, um, uh, add up the numbers, uh, 1,530 weeks in specific GOIDs where there was not a burglary. And then you've got 258 weeks where there was a burglary. So if you just do that part, if I just said there's never a burglary, we would be 85.56% accurate. So, and if you really look, how many times were we actually predicting with this model uh, when there was a burglary? Five out of uh, 
the uh, 1,788 times. I wouldn't call that. So when you see like that recall number down here, and I'll quickly go through some of this, you can see that's based on just didn't even need the model. Um, but those are the numbers that really stick out. So I'm really good right now at predicting where one's not going to happen by just saying it's never going to happen. There's never burglaries. I'm 85% accurate. That's not. I don't think that's what Chief Bowman wanted, was it? No. <laughs> and so we have, well, we're only 2% of the time where we're actually predicting anything. And so uh, it, what do we do? What do we do? Change the model. That's a good one. No, we actually started crying. Uh, <laughs> years. No, it was go back to the drawing board. This wasn't good. This is not. So accuracy does not equal performance. It's actually what Jason King said yesterday up here. Actually, added. I love the way he said it. Accuracy does not mean anything. And at first, you get it, and you're like, oh, this is wonderful. This is great. But look into it. See what it's actually telling you. What we really care about is getting these numbers up because we want to try to predict where they're going to be, not just predict where it's not, even though that's actually pretty helpful, isn't it? If you can predict where a burglary is not going to happen, isn't that good? But that doesn't mean to sacrifice never knowing where there's going to be a burglary. Um, so that's where we had to go back to the drawing board. So, um, and I went through that, but I'm not going to get too much into the stats. If you want to, come to, uh, you know, come, uh, to MTSU and I'll get you in, in some different uh, groups. Uh, I did put this up just to show the um, decision tree that kind of goes into that. And actually, median household income for people 45 to 64 was one of the uh, main uh, features, which was kind of interesting. Um, it just tells you that's probably more well-to-do areas, right? It's probably where burglaries are happening. Um, it's more of a predictor. Um, OK, reboot time, right? We obviously cannot go to Chief Bone and say, there's never going to be a burglary, so that's not, that's not good enough. Because that's basically what that model is saying. Um, so how can we make it better? So what do you think? What would you do? The, there's an obvious answer, right? Yeah, we got one. We could. Why did we go to one week? Uh, because of the weekly meetings. Well, weekly meetings <laughs> and actually, <laughs> you were supposed to say, and the research showed that about one yeah, to yeah. two weeks actually was the best predictor. That was a more fun according answer. According to other research. You're supposed to be scientific here. Yeah. I forgot that part. No. Um, I said, go ahead. Uh, additional data sources would be good. Um, go ahead. We could uh, obviously do that. Uh, oh, go ahead, back there. We could, and obviously um, we did a lot of that and just couldn't do it with the existing data that we had in there. It just didn't get that much better. Yeah. Yeah, and again, we did a lot of them mm -hmm. and it didn't get much better. So, um, go ahead. Well, there was. There was once, and we did do that. That was probably the number one thing we did. Uh, so three main things. I'm not sure if I, well, I think we put it in here, didn't we? Let me see. Yeah. Um, sorry, I was loud there. Apologize. If anybody knows, if they ever had me in class, Chris can attest to this. Uh, I get really, like, I'll start dancing and stuff <laughs> like that. In front of, I'm terrible. Um, so the first thing is we went after more data. The reason, one of the reasons we were at, like, one year and three years is because that was convenient. And that was, that was fine. But if we were really going to make predictions where we thought this was going to be a great thing, we were going to do that. And what were some of the yeah. challenges for you? Well, like, we switched systems three years ago. And so, like, immediately it seemed obvious. Because, like, if I were to get more than three years of data, I would have to, like, really get in there and pull some teeth with IT in order to get that data. And so when we first started the project, I figured, well, three years is good enough. And I guess when it, eventually this model worked out a lot better, not to spoil the ending, but... Um, it, eventually what I learned is more data is worth it. It's, more, it's worth those talks with IT and those meetings and trying to figure out SQL on your own. So um, it was a matter of convenience at first, um, but eventually uh, it, it was a matter of convenience because in the real world people switch systems sometimes and you have to find a new way to get the same data. Mm -hmm. 
And, um, and so part of that noise problem, and let's think about this. Remember the census data? Never changes. So we're adding in a constant when we're looking at the same year. And we're, why? Why are we doing that? And I'm like, and so we finally were just sitting there one day. It's like, can we just get rid of it? Just get rid of it, go after more data, and maybe we look at our target variable as a different, something different there. And uh, immediately Chris had said, well, why don't we go for subzones and tell us what subzones are versus yeah. GOID. So, so in Murfreesboro, there are three distinct police zones that everyone already knows. Um, so the entire city basically more or less evenly is divided up into seven areas. And we wanted something that had fewer than the 76 uh, GOIDs, uh, but more than seven. And eventually we settled on 29 by breaking up each uh, existing police zone to be its own unique thing. So that if I can go up to some police officer without anything else and just say, hey, can you be at XY area, which is a subzone, they would know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and also, th this took a, a fair amount of work because you have these existing zones, but where do you draw the line? So one of the things I had to do was go into zoning data in a zoning map and see, well, is this, is this a residential area? Is this a commercial area? Is this an industrial area? And then also talk to a lot of officers like, and have these really awkward one-on-ones where I ask them, if you were to divide up the zone, where would you draw the line based on the characteristics of the area? Um, so that in, in a way that's kind of similar to cluster analysis, each subzone is, is more similar within than dissimilar between. Yeah, I love that. You know, Chris had you know, the, the kind of the guts to go talk to it. You ever see a police officer? You know, they're not small. They're, they're pretty you know, assertive. And they love data people, right? <laughs> love data people. The, the, and and the, so for him to walk up to them, like, hey, you know, this is, you know, and, and so he did it. And, um, and did it in a, I would say, a very passionate and eager way and got the data kind of quick. I think the harder part was getting to the 10 years because we're, we're working with different systems. Nobody coded anything the same. So false alarm was in there seven different ways um, and all of that. And, and so a lot of cleansing had to happen. And I wanted to make sure we did it in a way that was repeatable. So we created a lot of, uh, you know, kind of translation tables in between. So if, if I found five to eight different ways for something to be uh, coded in the system, it's pretty easy to create a translation table in between. Super, super easy stuff. Um, the, the 29 subzones just make sense. And I love, we were giving the police department something they would never be able to operationalize. 76 or 75 zones, um, how are you gonna, they, they can't think of how, oh, that's number um, 42. They're not gonna do that, but within a subzone, to say that's uh, zone five in the northeast corner of that, they know that immediately. And it just makes sense that that is the right approach. And you know, again, this is part of our discovery. It takes a while to talk through this, talk to police officers to really find out what they want to get to that part. So this was probably the biggest component to what we were doing. Trying to pinpoint exactly where a uh, burglary would be wasn't really the point. It was to have somebody patrolling that area and a subzone was good enough. And like that was probably the number one thing. So every time you maybe, maybe it's your target variable that's the problem, not the actual features sometimes. Think of that um, in future problems problems. Um, we removed census data altogether. Just removed it. Um, first of all, I love that we're not doing any type of profiling. No more of that. We can't, the, the police department can't, I think it's a lot harder to say that this model is um, racially profiling or doing something evil if it's looking at only activity. Like I always love creating models based on activity only because again it doesn't have a, as much bias involved. Um, hopefully it doesn't. Um, so that's uh, obviously a, a pretty big point. Um, and of course, the more data uh, we, that we went into that uh, model. So with that, we went through and did kind of the same stuff again. And this ends up being our feature variables. <laughs> Notice we got rid of most of the, uh, well, not most, all of the census data. And so everything now is different each week. And so, you know, we code everything based on the subzone, a year, and a week. And then we obviously concatenate all that together to create some type of unique variable, and then grouped everything based on that, pivot it, melt it, to create these uh, uh, different uh, weeks with the data. 
And uh, so you can think about that. That's not exactly 10 years, but 480 uh, weeks um, uh, kind of gives you an idea of, of where that uh, model is. Uh, and then we did three different classification models, mainly because, again, being the teacher, I like showing a probabilistic one, a decision tree, and an ensemble approach to uh, classification. And you I like to stick with the basics in the beginning, and then we can go into things. But I don't think we really need to, I mean, I'll be honest. When we started this, Chris started his first sentence with, I want to create a deep learning model yeah. for predicting vertebrae. I said, can we start with logistic regression? It was a cool thing to do. It's like, yeah. It was a cool thing to do. And I'm like, with how much data? And, uh, and then I was like, we'll start with the basics. We'll work our way up from there. Um, but Maybe one of the one good things about having logistic regression is, of course, you can get probabilities to go with it. The, prob the probability likelihood of it, of it being a 1 or a 0, we can obviously get that. Um, decision trees are nice because we can visualize what our features are. And then, of course, a lot of times, you know, I know that random force is a black box, but in most, a lot of cases, it ends up being your best, most predictive model. Um, so, if, I'll, I'll, you know, for anybody that's new or this is something you've just started doing, um, kind of follow that. Think about always in, importing your data, cleansing your data, get an X and a Y, always start with logistic regression and then prove it to not be the best. And you'll always, uh, that's the best starting point for, you know, again, starting out. If you can get a decision tree in there, it makes you feel good because it, it visualizes all the different features, how they tie together, and they make sense. And then go into random forest. Then go into creating some different cross-validation type modeling. Um, then going into how to create the best model. All of that after the fact, but do that first, working through. And that's what uh, we, we did um, initially so that I wanted Chris to understand what we were doing more than just give him a result. So um, anything to add to uh, those kind of things? Well, one of the things that um, we talk a lot about the, at these conferences about not giving too much detail, um, but sometimes a little more detail, I think, can help just with the psychology of your typical police officer. Because if you say, like, I know they, they don't want to hear probabilities all the time, but degrees of certainty um, just kind of gel better with your believability as an analyst. Um, because if you say I'm 75% certain versus I'm 95% certain, they get that, they understand what that means without it being too complicated. And it also gives you a little like wiggle room if you're wrong. Um, and also just kind of is a good way to quantify the degree of certainty. So that's why I was happy to do uh, logistic regression because that spits out probabilities which are understandable to anybody. Um, and yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you know, I mean, if it's 52% likelihood, making it a one as opposed to a zero, it's, it's kind of hard to say. But if it's 99, all right, that makes sense. It's a one at that point. And, and so anyways, um, definitely something to think about as you're getting started or not getting started with that. Oops, did I go the wrong way? I did. Didn't want to go in that. OK, so I'm um, going to, obviously, logistic regression being the first one. Um, not as accurate as that first one, but we are doing a better job, as you can see over on the right side, of predicting um, where uh, the, um, oh, I'm looking at the 2019. Um, with our training data, we obviously are doing better. We got to 59% as opposed to 2% for being able to predict where burglaries are happening better. Um, so we felt a little bit better. So then what we did, by the way, so you think about train test split, you get, take all your data, we did 30%. So you're training with the 70%, you're testing with the 30. Um, but then we also took 2019 data and adjusted that and also used that for predictions as well. Um, so it's not as much, but, um, and so that's why I've got two different ones up here. So this is what it looks like with the uh, training data and the test data and, um, and then the same model just predicting with just 2019 data. So that's what you see on, on the uh, right side there. And you can see kind of our results here. So here's zone 1A for week 31. Um, and that's, so our sub-week is here. The probability of it not being a burglary, the probability of it being one. And you can see 1, 1, 1, so we predicted it. We, uh, for both logistic and random forest, and there actually was a burglary there. So I'm not saying it was perfect every time. Trust me, it's not. But we were better. We felt better about it. 
So, um, and of course, some weeks are better than others um, when, when doing this. Um, if you wanted to look at it in terms of uh, decision tree, and I apologize, I had no idea if it would be something you could see or not. So I'm trying to fit everything on my screen. Apologize for it being so small. But what's interesting at the top is nothing new. Burglar alarms from last week are a predictor for burglaries this week. And that's nothing new. But we validated that, and now I know that Chief Bowen is probably going to ask you how many burglaries there were, burglar alarms there were in that um, subzone if you're going to be saying that there is uh, something um, that's going to happen there next week. Yeah, and police work has been the, so, the same way for so many decades now that if you go up to someone and say, like, hello, officer, friendly, um, like, I think there'll be a burglary in this subzone next week, a lot of the times they'll say, because they've been doing the same thing for so long, is, well, how, how do you know that? And so if you can say something along the lines of, well, there were more burglar alarms last week at that zone, and I know from my, this is kind of getting off the rails a little bit, but I know from my work that um, that's a predictor of burglary, that sounds a lot more convincing than if you just say, hey, go here right now. Yeah, and I think, I think even the next little uh, parts of this is we've got to be able to sell this now to police officers, right? I think that's where the BI component now comes in. We've got to be able to visualize this as best as we possibly can for them to be able to um, buy in. Because we're now, we're now basically rerouting police officers if we're doing this right, right? And that's what we want. It's, you know, we all can think of, well, yeah, we, you know, we need police officers at this point, at this time, when there's big events in the area. We can get that data. Um, where there's ATM machines, right, if you're going after that kind of uh, crime, which isn't home burglaries, but... Uh, that could be something we could use for other stuff. Um, and then for random forests, uh, this was our result. Again, this was our best accuracy model, and then we just have to determine which one works out best for us. So what we you know, do in the end is we just create a report that includes yes, no, right? A one or a zero. If it's that we, we predict that there's going to be a um, burglary in that subzone. And then we also um, spit out the uh, probability or the likelihood of it occurring through the logistic regression. And that really was because we wanted to have an ability to be able to visualize this on a map. And ones and zeros don't work as well as probabilities. Um, and so that really uh, brings us to that part. So um, I just thought I'd show you this. This was actually, I think, the last week of our data, right? I just added this slide. You're probably like, where did this slide come from? <laughs> um, but I thought you should see what um, the last predicted week. This is actually uh, July 28th to August. Um, and I can see that it's 2019 uh, underscore 31 for uh, the 31st week of, of 2019. You see the probability of uh, there not being a burglary, the probability of there being a burglary, and then whether we categorize it as a, a, a one or a zero. And we're not perfect every time. And you see it's like, well, it looks like you don't have any accuracy there. And, you know, there's some weeks that are better than others. I think the... What do you think about um, seasonal burglaries? Is there, is there some rhyme or reason to that? Like I'm, I'm thinking like summer doesn't sound like a one that's easy to predict, or maybe it is. Um, um, what, yeah. what is There's some seasonality, but usually um, it's, it's more about activity than it is about what, what the weather is. Yeah, and we started thinking about weather, and it's like, well, if we're trying to predict next week, does that mean we have to go find the forecasts? We can't go, or do we go based on actual? What, what is it that we use? Um, as part of that. So we could go, and it's easy to get actual historical weather data. Um, I don't know if we can get it for each subzone, but we could get it for Murfreesboro very easily. Um, and then we could just use next week's prediction as part of our model if we wanted to. And I think that's the next step. We haven't, we haven't added that part in. But all I keep thinking of is, if it's cold, I'm not going out and burglarizing houses. That's my thinking. It's like, maybe they think the other way. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I guess that's good burglar, I can tell you that. I run at the sound of anything, like a dog or anything. Yeah? Have you found situations where the model was clearly bad because of someone being off before the action? Like, police the right place, right time, or the right So, in production right now, we are just getting it into it. So, so we don't have the historical uh, data of, of it actually being used in, in um, in the field yet, but it's right now being put into production. And how does it work on the data? Because I would think with the data 
Hawaii race. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, sounds like she's setting us up for our yeah. next few slides, right? Yeah. Um, so let's get to that because that's, if I give this, or I'm sorry, if Chris gives this <laughs> to the chief of police, what's he going to say? Put yeah, put it in the trash. And by the yeah. way, I, the work that Chris does, those weekly reports, very visual. He's obviously put a lot of thought into how to make those something appealing to a police officer. Because you're right, they're going to look at it for two seconds. And if it's not red or if it's not green, they're probably not going to look at it for, for, for long. So, um, yeah, that was kind of the next thing that we had to kind of think about um, is how should this be viewed by the chief. Um, and, uh, and that's really where I, I went to Chris and said, what, what do you want to do? And at first, all I gave him was ones and zeros. He says, I think it'd be really cool. Well, go ahead. Yeah, I, I thought it'd be better, like I said earlier when I talked about uncertainty. Uncertainty is to color a map based on the probability values. So one of the things you can do really easily in ArcGIS is color according to a number in an existing table. Um, so that's what we did in the following slide. But one of the, the classic problems you get whenever you're trying to do anything in ArcGIS when it comes to coloring by a certain scale is where do you put the cutoff points? Because if, do you want it just be below 50% is red, um, sorry, above 50% 50, 50 is red, below 50% is green, or do you want to have certain cutoffs that make are more granular? And so one of the things that I went back to was this thing the FBI puts out, um, it's unclassified by the way, you can see it says right there, um, is that they already have a standard scale of um, probability that they use to describe everything so that they, everyone knows what they're referencing. Figure is why reinvent the wheel if the FBI has already done it for me. So you can see it ranges from uh, remote from one to five percent probability to nearly certain at ninety-five to ninety-nine percent probability. And now we have cutoffs and now we have values from the model. And then the final product looks like from this to this. And you see, week thirty-one was bad for burglary, <laughs> or at least forecasted as such. Um, a lot of red areas and orange areas, very fall colored. Um, <laughs> but, in July. Uh, yeah, in July. Yeah. But uh, that's what the end product looks like. And if you're an officer and you're already in one of these zones, um, and you're going to be in one of these zones according to your uh, sergeant, um, it's pretty obvious where to go now. Yeah. So, so that ends up being um, what we've decided as kind of the, the main visual out of that. Um, and obviously, you can think of you know, all of your uh, minds by going to, well, here's the other aspects that we can add. And, and, and trust me, that's kind of the next iteration. But we're at the point now where um, uh, Chris is able to ingest this into ArcGIS, take uh, the data straight from the database, mm -hmm. um, and use the code that we have straight in there. We're hoping it's a one button. Right now, it's three buttons. Three buttons. <laughs> we're getting there. Um, you know, we're working with their system. Um, but yeah, and I, and I think uh, it's pretty much um, at that. And you know, is that too much red? Well, we could start tweaking that, make it maybe where it's only the 95 to 100 percent being just the deep red um, and things. If he, we get some uh, uh, comments back. Um, I'd like to tell you where I live, but I'm downtown Murfreesboro. Yes, there's a lot of crime there. Uh, uh, but anyways, yeah. So so that's where we are now. Uh, first of all, before I ask anybody has any questions, before we do that. Let's give Chris a huge round of applause for the work he did. How, how awesome is it that he let this silly professor come in and go, hey, I can take data and let you do things with it. But it was his vision to make this really, really cool. So uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Shruti. I think those are streets. Um, oh, oh, yeah, because because it was kind of hard to show sh like streets, but um, the the blue dots that is uh, the U.S. interstate sign that is, indicates what road you're on. I mean, like in the red area, there are actually certain streets and then. You talking about these? Oh, those are just more streets that are showing yeah, those up. Are streets. These are down here. This one, this one that you're talking about. Up here too. This yellow one. So that's a street. 
uh, the little, the little yeah. green dot. Because anything green is is just streets. Everything in ArcGIS is built on layers, kind of like Photoshop. So I had the street layer on top of the colors. And so if you see those kind of like green smudges, those are just a bunch of streets that are winding around. But look at the background color for the zones that correspond to this. So make sure I get this right, Chris. So it looks like there's three that fall into the green yeah. area. Any other green is just the streets. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, your question's always right. So, uh, I saw a hand up there first. You're, American Community Survey. How much actual data was there? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say it's it was terribly high because a lot of the counts were pretty low, um, but I'm not sure what percentage uh, each one of those were. Yeah, we kept a lot of the median type data, so yes, it, w it may not be exact, um, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, we're actually posting this for the entire world to see. Yes, that's awesome. So let's say you implement this and have possibility for other areas. I'm assuming that's you know, some of the data that's current, and you're trying to have some kind of approximation effect to the effect of what you propose to do this as well as you do this. Yes, and I hope it has. It is a deterrent. Um, for that, but well, I mean, it's a good defense for me because if they go there and there's no burglary, then I, and I said there was going to be a burglary, I can just say, "See, it worked." Yes, um, there you go. And it, it, if there is a burglary and they are there, then they got them, and I can say, "See, it worked." <laughs> I like it. Uh, oh, yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Well, that, that's a good question. And my answer to that is like, why stop at burglary? We can just as easily run the same code with theft from motor vehicle or robbery. It might not work as well. But the, if you talk to cops, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, a lot of them will say, yeah, I'm a burglary guy. Yeah, I'm a drugs guy. Yeah, I'm a... I'm a theft motor vehicle guy. And so uh, we could just do more models pretty easily now that we have the code more or less established and have that ingest of data established in Python script. And, and realize, we have not said where police officers need to go. We have given another tool to a very smart individual, the chief of police, as well as his assistant chief and other sergeants and lieutenants. And they'll use, you know, again, we at no point have said this now needs to take over for 40 years experience. So will they make changes based on that? They might, um, we hope. Um, but yeah, that's a great, great question. So, oh, go ahead. Yeah, um, how about how much do you think that it serves the process of going out? Because I'm not meeting the geographic control and the specific feedback. And I'm curious if people think that uh, in alignment with just like, oh yeah, this is, here's the stuff we're just sort of tweaking now. Well, one of the things that I, I'm always challenged with in an, as an analyst in a police department is you don't want to be telling people what they already know or else you lose all your credibility. And I've learned that the hard way. Um, <laughs> but um, the thing about burglary itself is that it can really affect any, sw any swath of the population anywhere. And it has this very um, even nature to it. It's not always going to be in the same spot. So it was just a good crime to work with to begin with because it's believable that it could be at any area. And so forecasting for the next week is that much more valuable because you didn't really have a good idea to begin with um, just sitting there in roll call or something. OK, we, we do have to get down. I'm going to uh, quickly just, if anybody wants to get a hold of me um, for anything, oh, here's our, our last little bit. I think we kind of went through that, um, what our conclusions really were. Um, I'm going to go to just, if you want to get a hold of me, that's my email address. Everybody, uh, if you type in a PGN, trust me, I'm the only one you'll find on, on the internet these days. Um, I'm happy to work in any type of opportunity uh, through the Data Science Institute. 
We have a couple of different events coming up. We have Kirk Bourne coming into town on the 25th, um, and we've got, we call it the Night of Meetups. So we've got like four or five different meetups that have joined with us. We've already got 130 people signed up. We're buying the beer. We're buying, did I say beer again? Gosh, I'm <laughs> so sorry. Uh, and we're buying the food. We're buying the food. Um, and just come out and enjoy hanging out with a bunch of people that like data and want to hear about AI. We're doing a data dive. So we do these hackathons at MTSU. If you want to, if you have the ability to come on a Friday and Saturday, or even just a Saturday, and just want to hang out with students, come on. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll send you the link, um, and we can uh, do that. And then my last plug, I've got to do this. Um, there's too many awesome meetups in Nashville. And I'm just listing the ones that I've gone to in the last month. Um, but I love uh, my folks from Data Nerds. I've got Alex back here. Data Science uh, Nashville, uh, another absolutely fantastic one. I've been getting, uh, uh, I'm trying to learn Power BI, so I go to their meetups. And actually, I saw Cameron speak just a, uh, a, couple, of, uh, well, a couple of months ago. Uh, the Greater Nashville uh, Healthcare Analytics. And WIT, I think, is an absolutely fantastic organization if you haven't um, worked with them. You don't have to just be a female to go to their events. So I think you should actively um, do that as well. So if anybody has any other questions, when is, um, are they doing prizes like right at 3.30? I don't want to keep anybody from prizes. So, but if you have any other questions, you're welcome to come on up and talk to us. Otherwise, thank you so much and thank you for a great conference. <laughs>